Hey everyone, welcome back. Let's discuss research updates on probiotics, namely in the areas of immune system function. Time of year is very poignant. Food allergy or food reactivity and the stress response. Welcome to Dr. Ruscio Radio, providing practical science-based insights into health, exploring the importance of nutrition, lifestyle, and gut health through conversations with experts, research reviews, and personal stories. We break through the bias and the noise to bring you simple, trustworthy information that matters. One of the things that's so interesting about the one tool, probiotics, it has far-reaching benefit, immune system health, food tolerance, and the stress response, which is one of the reasons why we chronicle the research here on the podcast. So let's kick things off with a few studies helping us to better understand how probiotics improve immune system function. If you remember way back into the COVID days, the, the meat of the bell curve of, of COVID, I was calling out that it would make sense that probiotics could help with COVID. I was cautious, not wanting to put a recommendation out there before there was due evidence to support it. But now we're seeing more and more studies showing benefits for COVID amongst other things. And this is because your gut is one of the main areas, really 70% of your immune system is in your small intestine specifically. So with that in mind, let's look at a 2023 randomized control trial 30 patients with weak immune systems due to HIV. Now, this poses a model to see what effect will probiotics have in those who are immunocompromised. They were given a blend of lactobacillus and bifidobacterium. There was also some strep thermopolis in there, which is another one that you may see in the mixture predominated by lactobacillus and bifidobacterium. Dose, 20 billion per day. And what they found compared to the placebo, was that probiotics increased levels of white blood cells. Now, this should make sense if you bear in mind white blood cells, the, the main soldier of your immune system, not the only one, but certainly uh, a crucially important factor in immune function are your white blood cells. They're made by your bone marrow and by your lymphatic tissue. Connect that to the fact that we have this whole area known as your gut associated lymphatic tissue or your GALT. There's a tremendous amount of lymph tissue in the gut. So one of the primary areas where we produce white blood cells is the gut. And therefore, it would make sense that an intervention like probiotics, which helps the gut function better, would lead to an improvement in white blood cells. Now, what's going on underneath the surface here? We can speculate, and I feel this to be somewhat reasonable speculation. We know that many biological systems require hormetic stressors, meaning your bones without the stress of gravity will become brittle. Your muscles without strength training or some sort of resistance will become atrophied. And our immune systems require stimulation, just like muscles and bone, to function in a healthy fashion. And this is one of the things that probiotics seem to do. We've discussed all the receptors that the probiotics will trigger like these PRRs or pattern recognition receptors. Just picture a receptor in the lining of the gut that needs to be stimulated, just like a muscle needs to be stimulated. And these toll-like receptors, most chiefly toll-like receptor four, which regulates leaky gut. That receptor needs to be stimulated just like bone needs to have pressure put upon it or it becomes osteopenic or osteoporotic. Shouldn't be surprising here to see that in immunocompromised individuals, sadly with HIV, that the use of probiotics led to a measurable increase in their white blood cell count. By the way, if this has been helpful, please comment and subscribe. Okay, so let's go a step further. 2023 randomized control trial, 70 children with acute diarrhea. They were given bifidobacterium anomalous. So when we look at the blends of lactobacillus and bifidobacterium, one that may be included is bifidobacterium anomalous. And in some cases, they'll use just that probiotic. My preference is to use a blend, but you'll see some studies just like this using one. At a dose of 10 billion CFU per day, the probiotic reduced duration of diarrhea by two days, which is remarkable, especially if the length of diarrhea, let's say on average, I'm just guessing here, was five days. That's a pretty substantial reduction. It's also to make the point that the expectation shouldn't be if you're on 
or if you give your child probiotics, they'll never have diarrhea or a bout of acute diarrhea like this, but it will shorten the duration. And the same thing holds for cold and flu. So just bear that in mind. And one other study here in a similar vein, 2023 randomized control trial, 182 healthy subjects. They were given a lactobacillus probiotic at a dose of 50 billion per day. So now a little bit higher of a dose. And the probiotics led to 10 fewer sick days over a six month period. Again, I would consider this highly substantial. We discussed the improvement in white blood cell production. That in and of itself is gonna be helpful. But we should also discuss that probiotics in addition to being antibacterial, like we've discussed before, and have the ability to fight things like SIBO, bacterial overgrowth, they're also antiviral. In part, it seems that probiotics can actually block viral entry into the lungs. And one of the compounds here is called a bacteriosin. It's almost like a probiotic-derived antibiotic because probiotics they secrete antibacterial, antifungal, antiparasitic, and apparently antiviral compounds. This is part of the reason they're so health promoting. So apparently those bacteriosins are also antiviral. Now their name would imply they're antibacterial, but as we're learning more and more about what probiotics do, a compound that was discovered to be antibacterial upon further examination, we may uncover is also antiviral. And so to quote, bacteriosins act as novel antiviral agents for viral suppression. And I wanted to share this diagram, which makes it really visually obvious what's happening, but I'll of course narrate for those of you just listening to the audio. What you're seeing here, uh, this is either gut or lung epithelium. So the lining of the gut or the lung uh, somewhat similar, obviously different, but but there's some similarities in that it's a partially absorptive membrane that also has mucus and a local immune system. The virus is covered by these bacteriosins, making it harder to enter the lungs and also easier for the immune system to tag. Just wanted to make sure to share all of the important benefits, again, especially given we're in the throes of cold and flu season, that probiotics impart. They increase white blood cells, they increase lymphatic tissue function, and they're even actively antiviral. So just one thing to keep in mind as we're going into or continuing to go through cold and flu season, they used either a single species or a combination of different species, but all within the categorical type of blends of lactobacillus and bifidobacterium. Any blend that is of quality manufacturing of lactobacillus and bifidobacterium, look for or start at a dose between 1 billion, anywhere through 50 billion per day. Moving on to stress. Regarding the connection between your gut and the stress response. Now the stress response is kind of broad. This could mean someone's anxious, depressed, has poor memory, has poor sleep, just to name a few. Or they may just notice that they're intolerant to stress, right? They're trucking along okay, but they notice any even seemingly small amount of stress can tip them over into being depressed, being anxious, sleeping poorly. Enter a 2023 randomized control trial, 45 healthy adults, who were self-reported to be under moderate to high levels of stress. They didn't write themselves as normal stress or eustress. They were given bifidobacterium longum versus placebo at a dose of 10 billion CFU per day. Interestingly, the probiotics reduced stress by 21%. Again, I would take about a quarter reduction of stress any day. Now, there's a combination of things examined here, self-reported subjective stress questionnaires, how stressed do you feel essentially in a, in a peer reviewed stress inventory. But get this and I'll, I'll quote, perceived stress correlated with a reduction in anxiety, in depression, and in the cortisol awakening response. So what they documented was as the probiotics led to that 20% or 21% reduction in perceived stress, it correlated with less anxiety, depression, and in the cortisol awakening response. Probiotics have a beneficial impact on the stress response. And a lot of this ties the gut to the brain through the region in the brain, the medial temporal lobe 
the limbic system, which contains the amygdala, the thalamus, the hypothalamus, and the hippocampus. Let's continue with some of the research, and I'll weave in a, a touch more of the, the physiology here. 2023 randomized control trial, 129 healthy adults with stress. Again, they were given lactobacillus, in this case, plantarum, so different probiotic, 10 billion CFU, and they documented that the probiotics improved memory and cognitive function. We talked about the stress response, anxiety, depression, and cortisol, but what about memory and cognitive function? Well, it turns out that if you have an overactivation of the limbic system, you'll have higher anxiety, higher depression, and you'll also have correspondingly poor memory. So the underlying physiology is probably the same. Things that improve the health of the gut have a attenuating impact on the activation of the center in the brain known as the limbic system. This leads to less perceived stress, less anxiety, less depression, healthier cortisol levels, and also improvements in cognition and memory. Part of the reason why I'm such an advocate for probiotics is research like this. Never to say any one tool will be a cure-all, but shucks, it would be a real travesty if someone didn't make sure to go through a thorough probiotic protocol if they were trying to improve their health. And the final study here I wanted to share, 2023 randomized control trial in 152 overweight adults. They were given lactobacillus rhamnosus, so a different type of lactobacillus. The dose was not listed in this study, and they found probiotics led to a slightly different improvement in stress. There was less binge eating and less food cravings. Now, I haven't experienced this in quite a while, but I do remember distinctly two things helped me to deal with organic chemistry midterms, finals, exams. And one of them was chocolate and sweets. In fact, my buddy Dave used to jokingly bring me a chocolate chip cookie when we were going into study blocks because he knew that I would just have cravings. Now, I think I'm quite a bit healthier now than I was then, but it's just to articulate the point that many of us have probably experienced that stress can spur food cravings. The other thing that was helpful was the uh, first shooter Jurassic Park video game, just because I got to be up and, and shoot and move. And it kind of got me out of being so in my head regarding Orgo and allowed me to do something kind of fun. So anyway, um, go UMass. Now, in all these studies, they used a dose of 10 billion CFU per day. The probiotics were different, right? So single species, different species, all showing benefits. Part of the reason why we continue to summarize this data into the meta protocol, use a lactobacillus and bifidobacterium blend, and this way you're going to get the different species as have been used as single species in some of these studies, but also other studies have used a combination. And there's a trend, it's not conclusive, but there is a trend suggesting that a blend is better than a single species. Now, coming over to food allergy. Given what we've discussed about the immune system thus far, it shouldn't be surprising to see improvements in food allergy and in food reactivity. Now we have, with the research, the luxury of meta-analyses. This first meta-analysis summarized 21 randomized control trials in over 4,000 children. They were given a blend of lactobacillus and bifidobacterium, so the same type of probiotic we've seen throughout all these studies, sometimes blends, sometimes single species, but they have that common thread. This being a meta-analysis, there will be different probiotics used at different dosages. The dose range was between 1 and 15 billion. Probiotics reduced food allergy symptom by 14%. And quoting, we conclude that probiotics can serve as a vital therapeutic option in tackling food allergies among children. And again, part of the reason why is likely because food allergy being in part immune system mediated, the probiotics have a favorable impact, kind of like weight training does on muscle, and the probiotic has a favorable hormetic stress function for your immune system, therefore attuning it and preventing overactivation. One of the things that comes up occasionally when we discuss elemental diets, meal replacements that are meant to be gut reparative, 
one of which, one of the formulas here, uses whey protein. Sometimes people will say, oh my goodness, I can't do dairy. Firstly, lots of people can do whey, especially if it's a lactose-free whey. Secondly, as I've discussed in the podcast before, there are a number of clinical trials showing you can improve lactose tolerance when using probiotics. So here we have a 2023 meta-analysis of 12 studies using blends or combinations of lactobacillus and bifidobacterium at a dose of anywhere from 1 billion all the way up through 100 billion, between 1 and 50 billion, is a good sort of meta-protocol starting point dose. However, some studies are using higher, in this case, all the way up through to 100 billion. And I'll just quote, the administration of probiotics was effective at improving adult lactose intolerance. Perhaps two or three main reasons why we see improvements in food allergy and also lactose tolerance. One, the microbiota. Part of the reason someone may react to foods is because there's too much bacteria. The bacteria overly ferment the carbohydrates, let's say in gluten, the FODMAPs, the carbohydrates in dairy, the lactose, also a FODMAP. And that leads to pain, pressure, discomfort, gas, diarrhea. Now, if that is mediated by bacteria, we know, as we covered a moment ago, that those bactericins are not only antiviral, but also antibacterial. So if too much bacteria leads to too much fermentation, a correction of the level of the bacteria leads to a correction of fermentation. Therefore, no gas, no pain, no diarrhea. And part of the reason why we see improvements in food reactivity. Now, beyond that, if someone has leaky gut, which we also know probiotics can mitigate, thank you Frontiers in Immunology for publishing a meta-analysis documenting that probiotics are a viable therapy for leaky gut earlier this year. But if you have leaky gut, the enzymes that are made by the lining of your gut, this is the microvilli, right? It's been documented that you will have a reduced secretion of lactase to digest lactose, of DAO to digest histamine, and of other enzymes needed to break down your food. So another reason for food reactivity is a suboptimal production of enzymes because of an irritation of the brush border, which can be rectified by the use of probiotics and the important relevant clinical outcome data via this meta-analysis document improvements in the end result of food reactivity. So if you have leaky gut, part of what can be happening is an immune-mediated reaction to the foods that leak through. Because as leaky gut implies, things are sneaking through the membrane that shouldn't. And what awaits the other side is your immune system. And so, if we can regulate the immune system through resolving leaky gut, but also triggering these gut receptors, these pattern recognition receptors, these toll-like receptors that are waiting to be triggered, well, if they're overreactive, if the immune system is overreactive, they are going to have an excessive inflammatory response to certain foods. But conversely, if we can lead to a dampening of overactivation, as we've illustrated earlier, we'll have less immune-mediated reactivity to certain foods. So to summarize that cluster of studies, lactobacillus and bifidobacterium blends at a dose of anywhere from one up through 100 billion per day. And also to learn more about food allergy and what you can do to prevent and resolve those, please see the video that we recorded specifically dedicated to that topic. So zooming out and taking in all this data collectively, we see that probiotics can mitigate a overzealous stress response by dampening the amygdala, which will lead to less anxiety, less depression, correction of cortisol, and will also improve cognitive function. From an immune perspective, we'll have better production of white blood cells better production of the, immune of the immune mucous membrane in your gut, 
and also a reduction of sick days and diarrheal illness. And then finally, you'll have less food allergy, including but not limited to lactose tolerance, which may allow you to enjoy dairy again. And as someone who loves cheese and yogurt, I can say, hopefully, welcome back to the club very soon after you use probiotics to get you over that intolerance. So all of this, hopefully to impress upon you that while there is no panacea, a mainstay of just global healthy existence, certainly gut health, and because gut health influences so much, they're interconnected, would be the use of probiotics. Now we've covered a number of studies today that have looked at either single species or multiple species, lactobacillus and bifidobacterium. The specifics of the formula don't seem to matter because as we've covered, either in single species or multiple species with different single or multiple species formulas, success across multiple studies. Also, the dose range is not highly meticulous. Really, anywhere from one to 100 billion, at least in this suite of studies, has been shown beneficial. And I think a good starting point is between one and 50 billion per day. Now on that note, we are currently continuing to collect data and we're hoping to submit something for publication early 2024 to publish in a scientific journal, giving healthcare providers and the public guidelines for this meta protocol. So we can finally get to a point of clarity around probiotics because one, of, and sorry for the, the tangent here, but one of the things that's been upsetting to me looking at probiotics is industry seems to be too influential. Now, it's a subtle influence, but in many of the studies that conclude you need this specific formula or this specific dose, you can tie that back to a company that manufactures that specific strain. So what we're attempting to do is take a unbiased summary of the data to give people a simple starting point for probiotics. Because what we want to do is have guidelines for use, move through a protocol, and then evaluate, is this working? If so, how much? And then be able to move on to any other interventions and not sort of flounder for too long in the probiotic protocol. Have guidelines, have a target, have a reevaluation period, go through the intervention, reassess, and then move to either maintenance or whatever the next experiment may be to try and further improve your health. Alrighty guys, well, hopefully you found this as interesting as I did and I'll talk to you next time.